Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Jiffy Steamer, the largest steamer manufacturer in the world. It started in 1940 right here in Obion County, Tennessee. Find the Jiffy Steamer dealer closest to you at jiffysteamer.com. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's special guest, what is something you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I discover in order to determine the age of specimens and samples, geologists and paleontologists use a technique called radiometric dating. Thank you very much. And we uh, have a lot of uh, information about things like that here at Discovery Park. I'm really excited today to get to talk with Bob Keast. He's the manager of the Tennessee River Freshwater Pearl Museum and the Birdsong Resort. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be with y'all. So before we get started talking about pearls and everything going on there, I would love to know a little bit more about you, where you came from, and how you ended up in this fascinating business. Well, I guess it all started in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a little town called Ironwood. And when my uh, grandfather delivered me, my mom and dad and my two older sisters packed up the car about six days later and they went down below Austin, Texas. And uh, to get away from uh, tons and tons of snow, and this was in the early uh, 1950s. And so uh, that puts me at 71 years old. And uh, then they uh, owned a restaurant, bought a restaurant, a little hotel. Uh, They always wanted to be in the tourism business and going into all the lakes up in Michigan and the Great Lakes and all the all through Wisconsin, they were boaters and they loved the water. And uh, so they wanted to have a little resort and a marina. And in 1961, there was a small ad in the commercial appeal in the one ad sections uh, for sale, boat dock, Camden, Tennessee. That's all it said in the phone number. Back then, uh, it was LU47880. LU was uh, the prefix, uh, and here in West Tennessee, a lot of the Bell South people uh, had had phone numbers that had a name in front of the last four digits. We still have that phone number today. LU4 is now 584 on that keypad. So 584-7880 happens to be our same number that we've had for the last 60 plus years. So this place was up for sale and my grandfather and grandmother happened to pass away and left my mother and uh, with a little bit of, uh, uh, of extra cash and they just bought the place. And uh, so we've grown up here, uh, graduated from Camden Central High School. I played football for four years, uh, went to UT Martin for a year or two in business and uh, then uh, decided to settle down here back at the marina and got an education in boating. And now, how old were you when you arrived? I was 10. What do you remember and, uh, about what, what it, uh, as a 10 year old, that's being 10 years old is an incredible age to me. So what, what, what was it like when you got here? Describe it for us. Well, it was gravel roads. Uh, the boat dock was uh, about as big as your office. <laughs> or my office, or anybody's office. That was the size of the boat dock. It was on four 55-gallon drums that were plugged off, where so they had buoyancy. And, um, and yeah, after a few years, they would rust away. And uh, we had, we had a, a, an old lodge building where my sisters and, my, and myself and mom and dad lived. And then downstairs was the, um, the, the hall where everybody came to eat. And my mother would cook uh, family style. She'd count noses at uh, four or five o'clock in the morning when she was feeding all the fishermen uh, breakfast. And uh, you came to the dinner table at seven o'clock and and you passed around the food just like we normally do in society. But she started it back then and you ate whatever she served you. 
<laughs> and so, so, um, so for people who, um, are not from around here, uh, can you tell us a little bit about were those, uh, fishermen fishing for fun or was oh, yes. businesses well, or what, what was it? Primarily here in West Tennessee, uh, we, we, they love the crappie fish, you know, up there in your real foot area, you have, uh, you have all the, the great, uh, little resorts and you got boyettes and that serve fish and, and so here on Kentucky Lake, here uh, at the extreme eastern side of West Tennessee, we we have a big run in crappie. And crappie seems to be the, you know, probably the best fish that everybody loves to eat. And uh, where they'll turn their bass loose in bass fishing tournaments, they'll take and keep the crappie. So the crappie run in the springtime was the big was the big thing, and it still is the big thing uh, today. We still have a lot of crappie fishermen early in the spring, March and April. So we had gravel roads, a small boat dock. Uh, <clears throat> we bought 10 brand new boats from the McKenzie, Tennessee Boat Works. Uh, often known, some of the old timers remember the boat called Cherokee. And as they're in Gibson, or in Carroll County. And uh, so we bought 10 of those brand new. And uh, we would rent them out for a dollar a day. And me as a little kid, I would help bring the customer's boat motor from the trunk of their car or uh, the, the back end of their station wagon, their eight or 10 horsepower motor. And I'd lug it down to the end of the dock and I'd put it on a boat and put the gas tank and hook it up and start the motor up. And I'd dip them their minnows and I would get a tip. Okay. So at 10 years old, you'd get a $5 tip. It was pretty serious money. So at age 15, I decided to go down to our local Chevrolet dealership, um, Ray Smith Chevrolet. And by the way, their son, uh, son-in-law was Jim Kaiser that had Kaiser Chevrolet located there in Union City. And uh, then their son has the, uh, has, uh, the uh, pharmacy there in Union City. Uh, Jason owns the pharmacy there. Okay, so there's there's a little bit of tie-in from Benton County to to, to uh, Union City, and so at 15 I ordered a brand new, uh, maybe it was 16. I ordered a brand new 67 Chevelle and paid cash for it from money that I collected from the time I was 10 till I was 15 and a half, 16 years old, and uh, so it was a, a 67 Chevelle which. Today, we call them the muscle cars. <laughs> so from that era, uh, mom and dad uh, passed, uh, uh, dad passed in 87, mom passed in 98. And uh, as soon as I got out of college, uh, I married my high school sweetheart. And uh, we lived uh, till she passed with cancer in uh, 2009. So she pretty much has helped me through the whole years with the the business, the resort, the marina, uh, the campground. We actually are operating in nine businesses. So we've got a yacht club. We have not only the Pearl Farm, but we have the Pearl Museum. So we are aquaculturists and um, we grow the freshwater pearl, which happens to be the state of Tennessee's official gym. Now, you ask, well, what's a gem? Well, most people think they're rubies and emeralds and sapphires and diamonds, and they all come from the earth. But there are two animals that produce a gem. One, the mollusk, which is the mussel, uh, and it's freshwater here. And the other is the elephant, which makes the tusk, which is uh, uh, scrimshaw jewelry. And of course, we don't use the elephant tux anymore to make to make jewelry. They've kind of outlawed that. Uh, but the mussel, which is native to Tennessee and native to the Tennessee River, uh, the mussel produces the gem. So in 1979, during um, Governor Alexander's administration, uh, they passed a bill through the House and the Senate creating the Tennessee River Freshwater Pearl as the state's official gem. So all the children that get their, uh, in the library, get their blue books, and every senator and state representative likes to send the constituents their blue books. There in there is, a, is a, our picture and so forth. And by the way, uh, just this past uh, spring, 
they built a new building, the state did it uh, next to the um, the Sounds Baseball Stadium in downtown Nashville called the Library of Archives. And the Library of Archives, uh, it was a $125 million building and just opened. And it, and it holds the Tennessee state constitution amongst everybody's birth records, death records, um, records of marriage and, uh, and divorces and all the photographs that have ever been taken through the state is all archived there. Great new building. So back a couple, three years ago, the architect called us up and said, hey, we need a picture of your state gym. And uh, so we sent him a picture and etched and engraved in 20 foot, uh, in 20 foot vertical and uh, 12 foot width engraved is the Tennessee uh, muscle and the Tennessee state gym, the pearls in the muscle. And it's engraved in concrete etched, engraved and inlaid in, as you walk into the building amongst the other um, state gems or state uh, uh, symbols, which is the tulip poplar tree and the mockingbird and the, uh, you know, the Irish is the flower. And I guess Rocky Top is the song. If it's not the Tennessee waltz, I think they bargain back and forth to see which one gets the song every year. And so as the story goes, um, we have, uh, we have been real uh, instrumental with the state in promoting uh, the Tennessee River freshwater pearl. So we've got the museum here. We do tours. We get busloads of people in here from all over the nation. And uh, we're open seven days a week. So it's we're more than just a pearl museum and a pearl uh, farm. We're a full-fledged resort, marina, campground. Uh, we have a mobile home park. We've got the Yacht Club. So we're all on 38 acres here in Benton County. And of course, we're at the leading edge of West Tennessee. When you leave Nashville on I-40 and you head to Memphis, we're the first exit. It's called Birdsong Exit. So I've, I've that's kind of that. in a nutshell. I've seen it many times. Um, I have not yet visited, but after this conversation, I'm definitely going to. When did you first um, become aware that uh, pearls were a thing there in Kentucky Lake? Was it all the way back when you were a kid? Were you all already doing that? Yes. So uh, after I uh, kind of took the helm after dad passed away in, uh, in 87, uh, this man from Camden, named John Latondras, married a Japanese woman. And over in Japan, it's they have a, a person that was born in, um, uh, well, he passed away in 1958, shortly after World War II, named Kikochi Mikimoto. So Mikimoto has been the, let's call him the godfather of the pearl, okay? He learned how to grow pearls in Japan. Well, again, after World War II, then he he passes away, you know, about 10 years later. And Mr. Latondras marries a Japanese woman and brought that custom from Japan to America. And he happened to live here in Camden and had two or three brothers. And uh, they were a, a very um, astute family, very educated. And they put together they put together their uh, pearling operation and came to my father and mother and my late wife and I one night at supper and said, hey, we want to build a pearl farm at your resort and marina. And, uh, you know, my dad wasn't very interested in that, but me being the kind of the entrepreneur of the family and uh, in my 20s and um, mother and my mother and my wife was, oh, all about pearls. So it, we had a three to one vote and lo and behold, they put the Pearl Farm in in 1979. And again, that's when that's when Lamar and Alexander's administration created us as a state gym. And so, so what, what is that? What is that? What are the steps to creating a Pearl Farm? Well, first, you have to have the mollusk, the live mollusk. So today we send divers down to the bottom. They pick up live mollusk. We bring them to the lab. We cut one of the mollusks up and chop him up and make him into a shape. Well, how many shapes are in a geometry book? Quite a few. So we've got triangular, we've got round, we have coin, elongated, and teeth, 
uh, shark's tooth kind of looking. And so these various sizes and shapes, we take the organic material from the, the one we are cutting up and chopping up. And because the makeup, the DNA of a, of a mollusk is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Okay. And so you can be drilled, it can be shaped, it can be sliced and diced and cubed. And, you know, you can just make it, make a, make a shape. Then we take that shape and we put it into a live mollusk and we insert him in there. We put him in a basket. We hang the basket out at the farm and we wait eight years and we go back and get it. And there is a beautiful, luscious Tennessee State Gym. Born and how raised. are they? How are they hanging? Are they hanging like? Do you have poles stretched out across the water and they? Well, hang? we call it American-made bamboo, which is PVC water pipe. <laughs> so you go down to Lowe's and you get a forty-foot stick and you put a cap on one end and a cap on another, and so you've got a, a tube, and the tube is buoyed because we don't have the bamboo like they've got in Japan. We use that and we link that together and we make a farm. And of course, the Kentucky Lake rises and falls about six foot a year. So we have fluctuation. And um, so back in the 70s, we went to TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, and asked them for permission. And of course, they wanted to uh, look at it and look at all the diagrams. So we got permit number 0001. And, uh, and then I think they quit putting permits out. So it's allowed us to have uh, that golden opportunity to be something that is a little bit different when you look at pearls and, and you know, uh, pearls, uh, many, many, many uh, famous people like Elizabeth Taylor, Jackie Kennedy. Remember that picture on Life magazine of, a, of a Jackie Kennedy and little John John was pulling uh, uh, her neck or the her neck and pulling the pearls down. That was a picture that's been all over. And of course, Elizabeth Taylor's pearl, which was found off the coast of Panama in 1510, called La Peregrina. And she, uh, Richard Burton bought it for her and gave it for to her in a beautiful necklace uh, for a Valentine's Day gift. And some of the pearls on that necklace came from Mr. Latondres's, um collection. So, when Mr. Latondres passed away in 2000, my wife and I decided to continue the farm and have tourists to come in. So uh, we bought the farm. <laughs> and so uh, we bought, and, and then we made it a little showroom and started selling the pearls. And then, then CBS called us up and said, uh, We'd like to come down. Uh, Charles Osgood actually phoned me and said, hey, we'd like to come down and, and film y'all down there. And so I said, you know, come on. So we were on one of their issues uh, on Sunday morning. And, of course, Charles Osgood's no longer uh, on the set. And I think it's, uh, um, I can't think of her name, but but she now has taken over for um, for a good mo uh, Sunday morning. Jane Paul. And so they they filmed us. It's Jane Polly, I think. Jane I Polly, that's right, yeah. And so um, we show that video. CBS has allowed us to show that five-minute video. And uh, they spent about two and a half minutes here on location filming that made it into the into on, on the air. Took them two weeks to get two and a half minutes. Uh, I never can figure that out. But <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, it's perfect. They, it was, it's flawless. And... Uh, so they featured uh, an, an exhibit that started in New York and this man by the name of, of uh, Neil Landman. And uh, as Emily had mentioned about paleontologists, uh, he's one and he's also an archaeologist and he's the curator of the Museum of uh, Natural History. And he went all over the world collecting pearls and understanding and taking photographs and put the the largest exhibit on pearls ever to be known. Well, then Chicago Museum, at the Field Museum wanted it, then Houston wanted it, Atlanta wanted it, Milwaukee wanted it, and then it went to about 17 foreign countries. 
So our pearls, and then he came down here and got our pearls from Mr. Latondras and I. And so our pearls were right in there with Jackie and Elizabeth and Marilyn and uh, uh, Princess Diana and, um, and all the famous people of, of the world that has had beautiful pearls. And so if it wasn't for Mr. Latondras, we wouldn't be interested in pearls today because he really brought them to America. Okay. Are there, so are there other like, pearl farms? Are there other pearl no, farms like yours, other places in America? Not to our knowledge. The wow. only other pearl farm that we know of is in uh, uh, Mexico. And so it's, you know, uh, we're, we're the only freshwater pearl farm in North America. Okay. Let's put it like that. So when you look from Canada to Mexico, we're in. And uh, when you look at I-40 from the Atlantic to the Pacific, you know, Tennessee is centrally located. So the other pearl farm is in a town called Wymas, Mexico. And uh, we visited. I took my pearl farm manager, my wife, and my pearl diver. And we all went down there to kind of check, check our competition out, so to speak. And uh, they have a very high mortality rate we have a very low mortality rate because the waters of the Tennessee River, Kentucky Lake, uh, they're very good clean water. Uh, our ecosystem is real good. And, uh, you know, we've got milfoil and we got hydrilla and, and we have a good turnover and TVA gives us a good flow. So when you look at the water from East Tennessee, by the time it gets over here from uh, south of us is the Pickwick Dam, which is down in Savannah. Uh, and then to the north of us is Kentucky Dam, which is in Gilbertsville, Kentucky. Uh, most 90% of Kentucky Lake is in West Tennessee. So you ask, well, why do they call it Kentucky Lake? Well, that's where the senator was when they started naming lakes. lakes were. Um, but God created the Tennessee River, and man makes the lake. So the lake is the river, and the river is the lake. We're going to uh, come back in just a minute and talk a little bit more about uh, tourism and Tennessee and the lake. But first, we're going to take a really quick break, and then we'll be right back. Jiffy Steamer offers the world's finest clothing steamers, steaming products, and steamer accessories. They've been made in the USA since 1940 and now have more than 1,000 dealers across 55 countries. Jiffy Steamers are trusted by professionals such as Macy's, Neiman Marcus, Coach, and others. Find the Jiffy Steamer dealer closest to you at JiffySteamer.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please do us a huge favor and subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps us get the word out about what we're doing here on Real Foot Forward and at Discovery Park of America. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Bob Keast, and we're talking about a lot of things, but we've been talking about pearls and we're soon going to be talking about uh, tourism. But first, Bob, I'm curious, um, is there a particular time of the year that you put out the pearls that you'll be harvesting eight years from then? And is there a particular time that you harvest that year's pearls? We harvest pearls on demand through tourism. So let's say a bus load comes in here from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, they come to West Tennessee and enjoy all the things that we have to offer here. Even Discovery Park and Casey Jones Village and the Safari Park and us. And, and we have Loretta Lynn next door. So we've got a lot of things to do and see in West Tennessee. And so the coach of 50 or 60 people come down. They, they get off our coach. Or off their coach, and uh, we show them the video. We go through the process, and then we harvest the pearl, the mollusk. So we send our diver out to the waters. He comes in. He's dressed up in his suit with his, you know, goggles on and his, uh, you know, the garb. Uh, so he dresses the part, and uh, and so he brings the mollusk in, and we actually cut it open. And the tourists get to witness the pearl being birthed from a live mollusk. Okay. Now the children love it because they like to get their hands in it and they get them all slimy and so forth. 
Uh, the mollusk can reproduce himself about a million times a year. And so they have a very high reproductive. And I guess that's when in God, uh, when he created animal, uh, he created the mollusk to be under the water. And the main thing that a mollusk does, which is a clam, a snail, a conch, uh, an oyster, a mussel, these are all in the one family, and the family is called mollusk. So when God created the, the mollusk, he created them to, to filter the water. So they're a bivalve. They just filter the water. And let's assume that water is all bad, which we know it's not. But these guys will clean the water up. So in comes the bad water, and they digest it and spit it back out. As they grow from microscopic pinhead, and we've got some mollusk in Tennessee that grows as much as the dinner plate size, uh, basketball size, nine inches. Now, that's a 100-year-old mollusk. So they're still down there. They're down there so deep that the, that the uh, uh, divers can't go down that deep because there's places in the Tennessee River that's over 100 foot deep. Um, okay, so um, the mollusk lives and, and just breathes. So we harvest, we harvest them on demand, on demand when we have tourism groups. Okay, and that's all part of our tour. And then we and are you them are you ever are you ever surprised by the size of the pearl that's there, or do you kind of know in advance what size pearl each one's going to produce? Well, each one of our nets have a serial number. And then we can trace that serial number back to the database to say, what did we implant in there? Was it triangular? Was it teardrop? Was it a coin? And every time I open up a mollusk or my diver does, we call that our show and tell session. Whenever he opens it up, it's always a surprise. And uh, it's kind of like opening up a, a, a box of, uh, of crackers or a a box of cereal you don't know what's in you don't know what's inside you just know that there is a surprise inside so when that box of cracker jacks opens up and it's got something really neat in there you're just wow you know so everybody uh enjoys opening and looking at the pearls because it's coming from an animal and that's you've got to think about it it's coming from a live animal that god created and so sometimes you open it up and there's, it's just, you know, nothing. It, it, it's, yes. That's, that that's when we get into our mortality or our efficiency ratio. And as I mentioned, Mexico has a, a, a much higher degree of inefficiency. We are, you know, I, I don't want to put any real numbers out there, but we're up in the 90%. So, Nine out of 10, yes. So if we do get a dud, kind of like a package of fireworks, and you know, one, one firecracker didn't go off, you've got a dud, um, we just open up another one and move right on. And uh, we've had a lot of, a lot of tourism over the last, well, since, since we started our tours in 1980. So, uh, well, actually, we never started opening them up until 2000. So we would do little tours, but we never would open them up because Mr. Latondras, who owned the farm. So when he passed again in, in, uh, in 2000, then we bought the farm and then we started opening them up, opening up our, our inventory. So once we get the pearl out of it, then Mr. Latondras's daughter is a gemologist and a GIA certified gem gemologist. They take our pearls and put them in, craft them into jewelry. So our local artisans produce the the, the jewelry side of the pearl. And pearls are not that expensive, uh, 10 15 $20. That's where they begin. And uh, they go all the way up to maybe $1,000 or $2,000, depending on the size and the clarity and the shape and so forth. Uh, and speaking of prices, the one pearl that... Uh, uh, called La Peregrina that ended up on the neck of Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, again, 15, going back to 1510. So back then, the the, uh, the Spaniards, and uh, they they were all trying to figure out whether the world was flat or, or round. So, so your Balboas and your 
Ponce de Leon's and your Christopher Columbus's, they were all leaving Spain and Portugal in their big ships. So they end up down there to Panama and they find this one pearl. So like any good employee, uh, they take the pearl back to their ruler and uh, it went through a succession of royal hands from the Duke of England and Richard Bar Burton paid, I believe it was $36,000 for that one pearl. But the DNA shows it all the way back to Balboa in 1510, trying to discover was the world round or flat? That was the purpose. And they were sure all those sailors were all having a big clam bake and uh, into refreshments and, oh, look what we found. This is a gorgeous pearl. And of course, National Geographic Magazine uh, August issue of 1985 has it featured. And so when CBS Sunday morning showed it, they naturally showed that too. And it was also on display at the, all the museum all over the world for the, for the next 25 years that are traveling display. So when Elizabeth Taylor passed a few years ago, that necklace uh, sold at South of these places. I think Sotheby's auction house in or Christie's auction house in New York for 36 million. Wow. Yeah. I would like so, to open up a pearl with that in it. Yeah. Oh, it what would we all? Yeah. <laughs> but what would you do with it, Scott? Yeah. I mean, I, would, I would, would you, you wear it? I would call you to help yeah. me sell it. <laughs> Men generally don't wear pearls, but I have beautiful pearl cuff links now and I have per pearl tie tack. And then I, I, I wear a pearl uh, that I have on. And we've not only learned how to grow the pearl loose in the meat, in the flesh, okay? But we've also learned how to grow him in the shell. So it becomes a domain. And then we cut out around it. And that makes a shape. And you have the pearl in between. So there's all kinds of fashionable jewelry. And, of course, we're open seven days a week. And uh, it's, it's a free tour. Uh, people can come and sit down and watch the video and shop. Uh, again, show them the five-minute video. But then if you want to get on one of the scheduled tours, that's when we open up the mollusk and we have a big barbecue and uh, we bring the diver in. And so, you know, that's a fee base. But other than that, we're, we're a free museum. And we've always wanted that because folks traveling off the interstate, we're 10 miles north of the interstate. Uh, of, at exit 133. So it's allowed the folks uh, to get off the interstate, relax, go to the restroom, and uh, see something that, wow, I didn't know that pearls grew in Tennessee. So what um, you've obvious, obviously got a lot of irons in the fire. You're doing a lot of things. What takes it more of your time, the resort or the Pearl Museum? Well, I would say the resort and the marina and the campground takes up about uh, six or seven hours of my day. The pearl farm, uh, those pearls and those mussels are just growing sitting out there. And uh, we're still working off of inventory where we're not implanting anymore. Um, although I've gotten inquiries from uh, Japanese and Chinese um, uh, pearl farmers that have mollusks that they want to uh, grow uh, in the waters of here. So they've been in contact with me. I want me to start growing their, uh, their, their mollusks. And then once they get bigger, then they would ship them back to China and Japan. We've also at our farm, we've grown for the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, some of the mollusks that are on the endangered species list. So, you know, we're, we're a good neighbor to, to everybody. But you're about an hour. Question, you're yeah. about an hour and a half from us here at Discovery Park, um, and so I know I've heard people who visited here say they've stopped by there on the way here, and I'm sure you've probably heard uh, vice versa. Uh, what what sort of uh, amenities do you have there for somebody who's listening from a bit of a distance and wants to do both? Uh, I know you mentioned campgrounds. You you mentioned lodge. What what can uh, people expect? Well, we have cabins, individual cabins, and they're fully furnished, and you can rent them by the day or the week. Um, and then, of course, we rent boats, and uh, we have canoes and, and uh, kayaks and uh, aluminum bass boats and pontoon boats. And then, of course, our campground is open year-round. We're open all year because we actually live on the property. 
all of our staff live on the property. So uh, we go to work in our golf carts. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, uh, God bless uh, Ned Ray McWhorter, uh, our, late, our late governor from up in your parts there, and how he just uh, really helped Highway 22. And, uh, of course, John Tanner in Congress helped with I-69. And it's kind of tying, it, roads tie us all together. And yeah, we're about an hour and 15 to 20 minutes away from Discovery Park. And it uh, um, it gives an opportunity for a tourist to come to West Tennessee as a destination. That's the goal. There's more to do than in one day. Uh, just don't come to me and not go to not go to Discovery Park or vice versa, or go to the Safari Park or visit Loretta Lynn's. We're also home to where Patsy Cline lost her life here uh, back in um, 1963. And her plane crash was here in Camden. So we have a nice memorial there and a place to go. And uh, so being right here on the lake, the lake becomes the draw, just like Real Foot Lake is the draw up in up in your area in extreme northwest Tennessee. And then we have a lot of hunting. And so we have you put hunting and fishing and now attractions together. West Tennessee is really a the 21 counties. We're a hidden jewel of of uh, of the of the tourism marketplace. So it's just getting out and promoting and bringing more people into this area. So now um, I've heard a couple of times references to uh historic events. Are you a history buff? Oh, I love it. I love history. That was my teachers in high school. Um, I, I just couldn't get enough of it, you know? And so I really dwell a lot, dwell a lot in, in history. And every time I go out of town to tourism conferences or whatever, I'll find a museum somewhere. And uh, uh, I was up at the Smithsonian in DC and uh, I went to, uh, saw a room and it was the Edison room. The Edison, uh, Thomas Edison. Okay. Well, naturally, I'm interested in, in electricity and AC and DC and, and how the invention of TVA came about. Um, and Edison was good friends with Mickey Moto. And I saw a little article there, and I wouldn't have ever thought that, but Mickey Moto was gr trying to grow pearls in Japan, and Thomas Edison was trying to make a filament for the light bulb. And uh, the two of them inter had, had conversation. Now, I don't know how they did that back in those years. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't any email. And, uh, but it, the, the scope was that Edison uh, was looking for the filament, and he was thinking that the internal pieces of the oyster could make a filament, you know, in never ending. A little bit of trivia there. That's so interesting. I'm like you. I love history. I especially love Tennessee history. And uh, you rolled off those uh, Tennessee things off of your tongue really fast. I always have to Google the bird, the song. Uh, but, but so, so you're a proud Tennessean. I can tell. Very much proud. And and of course, uh, back uh, during uh, Governor uh, McWhorter's era, uh, he put together the the 200 celebration. That was kind of his brainchild, the uh, Tennessee homecoming. And then Lamar Alexander became the executor of it because it was all set up. And so all the communities across the state um, had something to do during Tennessee homecoming. And uh, then we had the 200 celebration at the Bicentennial Mall. I was part of that. And uh, uh, in fact, Jay Busey which is your Northwest East, retired Northwest Tennessee development district person. His son, uh, Jay A. Busey, um, was part of Tennessee homecoming in 86 as an up and coming, uh, uh, Tennessee employee. As we went all across the state, uh, tow all the communities and what they had to offer. So, and now governor Lee, is doing something two, two, five. So we're into 20, 2025, putting together another celebration. So through the governors and, and riding on the trains from Bristol to Memphis, 
man, what a what a huge thing as Lamar went from one end of the state to the other. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I've been through a lot of in, uh, inaugurations and a lot of the balls and uh, uh, been to Japan five times with three different governors on industrial recruiting missions. While they would be talking shop, um, we, I would slip off and go down and visit with Mickey Moto's Pearl Farm and Pearl Island and Pearl Jewelry. And I'd take the bullet train. And uh, I'll never forget, I was with, sitting with Ned Ray and, and he couldn't figure out how this train, he couldn't hear the tracks. He couldn't hear the wheels turning. And I said, well, Governor, I said, this, this bullet train is floating on the air like a hydrofoil, you know? Uh, so, uh, <laughs> little education on him as well, but, uh, uh, you know, if it wasn't for L Lamar Alexander in the early, early years of the, of the seven seventies, when he got in office, Mr. Latondras went with him to Japan on one of these recruiting missions and they came back with Nissan. And I think today, if I'm not mistaken, we're about 175 Japanese manufacturers on Tennessee soil. And uh, Plumley Rubber in one in, in one instant there in Paris is now another company owned by the Japanese. I don't know in Union City is is the Titan, is the Titan tire company that used to be Goodyear. Is that an American company or is that Japanese? I don't know. Okay. Good question. A lot of Japanese manufacturers have come into America because they're they've got a lot of money and they don't have a lot of land. And we've got a lot of land and we could use the money. So it's a two-way street. So every year or every other year, 75 to 100 Tennesseans go with the governor over to Japan for a three or four day conference. And all the big manufacturers of Japan, you know, you're, um, you name them, you can know all the different manufacturers. They Assemble with Tennessee and they say, well, we'd like to bring our goods and our wares to Tennessee. So the governor pitches the Tennessee and then every industrial person. Um, I can remember going one year with Wendell Alexander. He's passed away now. He was the industrial recruiter for Weekly County. And uh, so a lot of these deals are made overseas. And now Tennessee has, uh, we just announced uh, the Ford plant at $6 billion plus, going to employ five or 6,000 people. And the little town of Stanton, that's their zip code. If you look it up, it's probably 500 people. You know, it's like a Jack Daniels in, in uh, Lynchburg. Everybody in Jack, everybody in Lynchburg works at Jack Daniels. See? Um, but anyway, you've had real good people up there. You've had good politicians. And I think John Tanner was probably the most instrumental for your area. And being being close to Ned Ray and working the highways, I mean, 22 is just one of the most beautiful highways. And it stretches all the way to the Mississippi, all the way to Kentucky. That's sort of like our passion of, about trying to get I-69 open that runs right along Discovery Park of America. And that was engineered during Bredesen administration uh, with TDOT. And uh, I was on this uh, one of the Governor Bredesen sounding boards for uh, roads. And uh, I was pushing for an exit there. And uh, and so everybody was, too. So all of us in tourism, because in your in the beginning of you, we a lot of us tourism people kind of did whatever we could to see this happen. And um, I was consulted by, was it a Mr. Kirkland? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Robert okay. Kirkland. Robert Kirkland. And uh, he and John Tanner and two or three others came down and visited me and visited me at my Pearl Farm. Said, well, we need part of this up there. And would you be willing to do this and that? And of course, you hadn't even uh, got the, uh, the blueprint she had on building the building yet. But uh, I'm amazed at the building that you have. Uh, it, it reminds me of the Guggenheim in uh, New York City that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. Okay, so it has that same character. Okay, and I don't know if anybody's ever mentioned that to to you or not, but the Guggenheim is a very uh, shaped a museum in New York City. Very unusual. Okay, 
Yeah, we should uh, figure out some way to have a display of what you guys are doing here at Discovery Park. I don't believe we have, unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe we have anything represented here. I don't think so. I was a uh, vice president of WLJT television, their uh, PBS station out of Martin, and for many years, and we would have meetings over there with y'all uh, in your meeting room. And uh, so, and my wife is from Troy. And my brother-in-laws are brother-in-laws. My whole family is from from Troy, um, and and so I'm up there all the time. I mean, well, every other week. Come by and let's figure out something because we need uh, people to be able to see and experience and discover the fact that uh, you're doing that with pearls uh, here in Tennessee, and it's not happening anywhere else in the world. So I think that's fascinating. Well, you say in the world, in North America, uh, in, fresh yeah, water yeah, that's in North what I America. Mean. Yeah, yeah, in North America. Man, you go to Japan and everybody's got a pearl farm over there like you and I grow tomatoes. How, <laughs> how common is tomato vine in, in West Tennessee? Everybody's <laughs> got a tomato vine. Okay, So yeah. everybody in Japan has got a little piece of water and got a little, very small piece of land and a lot of water. And so they grow their, their, their national crop. And uh, so I'm real proud of Tennessee. I'm real proud of the uh, of our politicians and how they've moved. Uh, the, getting now with uh, back to Ford coming in here in West Tennessee, that that's going to be a huge shot in the arm. And it just didn't come open one night. Uh, somebody at Ford said, "I think we'll go to Tennessee." There's been 10, 20 years of hard work and with the solar farm there. They put a, a welcome center, a tourism welcome center. They're going to build a college there for the for industrial college for the workers. So it that's just going to open us up. And uh, we need to be looking at a highway from there all the way to Union City. Say just one, one just go right through the farmland, avoid all the cities, and just go straight into a new interstate there. Yeah, we're really excited about all the opportunities that that's going to um, afford both both the area, but also more people will get to uh, share our mission with here at Discovery Park of America. And your your facility is is uh, has brought in a lot of a lot of folks to West Tennessee, and as you say, we can share because um, I'm at the other extreme. I'm south and southeast of you and your extreme north and northwest. So as we look at the 21 counties of West Tennessee, there is just a tremendous amount of things. Uh, If you was to take inventory and uh, look at the Tennessee State uh, Vacation Guide that the state has in all the welcome centers and look at all the different places of things to do, then you've got you an itinerary and it's how to get from here to there. And uh, like coming down 412, you you can cross over at Brothersville and come into Dyersburg and get on 412 going into Jackson. And uh, what happens, you can go right by Alamo and, and see see the, uh, uh, the, the animal place. Oh, gosh. Safari. 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 There you go. Yeah. Man. At 71, you know, sometimes I do lose a little bit of that memory. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. I can relate. Now, if, if, uh, like I made myself a note to talk to my wife about, I'm, I'm definitely putting you on, uh, our list of things to do, uh, in 2022. Uh, where should I go to find out more information and to make reservations and things like that? Well, uh, I want to admit that I was good friends with Al Gore and we invented the internet together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that gets a little bit of a joke. So <laughs> my email is like Henry Ford's, henry at ford.com. I'm <laughs> bob at birdsong.com. So we have the we have the domain name Birdsong. And Birdsong then opens up to everything that we wanna we want to have. So it'd be like going to a web, uh, website that was fun, like www.fun.com, and there, there's Discovery Park, see? So we have a lot of things to do. So really, our website is just simple, birdsong.com. And um, uh, you can find everything, and you can switch over. Once you get to that website, then you can go over just to nothing but Pearl. And we, have, we do Pearl sales online and all of that. And you've got videos I see of uh, examples of things going on there. 
Uh, you've got uh, maps of the resorts, details about the cottages. Man, this is an incredible looking place. I cannot wait to go here. Well, we started out again. We started out with with Al inventing the internet, and uh, so we've been we've been at, we've been computerized uh, since the Commodore sixty four. <laughs> so all the some of the younger people have no idea what I'm talking about, but some <laughs> of the older folks do. So uh, we've and as technology is getting bigger and better, yeah, we've got a bunch of drones now, and I've got a drone pilot, and and that's kind of the fun things. And there's a lot of good marketing people here in West Tennessee. Uh, Discovery Park, you you guys do a tremendous job, and I look at a lot of a lot of things that y'all do and and try to get good ideas from. So it's just share and, and share alike. And so, yeah, you, you're more than welcome to come by anytime. Just let me know so I can shake loose of my other six hours of, uh, that I spend at the resort, the marina. I do a couple hours of, of uh, tourism. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I really appreciate you spending a little time with us today. It's been my pleasure. In fact, that's our motto. Our motto uh, has been, our business is your pleasure. Or we could say, your pleasure is our business. Like Either that. way you want to look at it, both play on words. I like that. Well, thank you so much for spending a little pleasurable business time with us today. Thank you. And thank you to all of you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Discovery Park of America.